Hi and welcome to the second video this week. We will be talking about the third module of linguistics. We are kind of digressing from the subsection a little bit to talk about acquisition uh, in first language and this is a very exciting module for me because um, I have an infinite home and she is beginning to start um, talking and form words and so um, a lot of what I talk about in this module uh, is quite relevant to people who have seen babies grow up or um, who have raised uh, babies. So you have new readings for this week and these are pages 309 to 341 of chapter 10 in your textbook. Uh, and I also have an extra reading uh, for this module and I will put that up under optional reading on Blackboard. Uh, and this is a chapter from William O'Grady et al's uh, textbook. And um, this chapter, this optional reading is actually going to be quite relevant for you when you do the uh, assignment uh, for this um, module, but that assignment isn't due until next week. So um, if you can't get to the reading this week, that's totally fine. You can complete the reading over the weekend and um, do the assignment next week uh, for the weekend after. So let's um, remind ourselves of the big picture and um, the big question that we're concerned with throughout the semester. What are the rules and mental representations that underlie our ability to speak and understand a language? Now, our entire interest in this big picture, our interest in linguistics really stems from the fact that as children, we learned a language and we learned this system that we are painfully uh, looking at consciously again in our adult years as a baby, right? And so how did we actually do that? One of the key insights from um, Noam Chomsky, uh, who's considered very often to be the father of modern day linguistics and who used to be um, a professor of linguistics and philosophy at MIT in Boston, Massachusetts, and now is a professor of linguistics um, at University of Arizona. Uh, one of the key insights from Noam Chomsky from the 1950s has to do with the fact that a newborn baby um, who, who comes into the world has absolutely no language whatsoever, but by the time the baby reaches four years old, by the time the baby reaches six years old, the baby has an entire full-fledged grammar in their heads, in their minds. So how did the brain actually go from this no language state to a full language state, right? To uh, a full grammar of English. This is the biological mystery that we were concerned with in the first module that we discussed uh, way back in week one. Now, when you talk about how children actually learn the system of rules and representation, one of the most common answers that I get is imitation right? Children imitate you all the time. They want to do things like you. They want to talk like you. They want to dress up like you. So imitation is a really good answer to how does a child learn this. But although there is some amount of imitation, that's not the entire picture. There's a lot more uh, to language learning and language acquisition than imitation. There are a couple of pieces of evidence that actually lends itself to the fact that it's not just imitation for language acquisition. First is that children make mistakes all the time. This is something which is very, very common uh, when somebody is actually learning the language. So children make mistakes like this, goad uh, and gooses. So the reason why goad um, is incorrect is because the past tense of go is actually went, it's an irregular verb uh, of English, and goose, the plural uh, form of goose is actually not gooses, uh, which is what we would expect if it was a regular plural, but goose is again an irregular noun, so you get geese and not gooses. So these kind of mistakes are very common and they are not imitation because you are not going around saying goat and gooses all the time. So where does a child actually hear these kind of things? Not obviously from the caregivers, but 
the children are actually trying to figure out the rules just like you and I are trying to figure out the rules in this class what are these phonological rules what are these rules of phonetic transcription we are painfully realizing that what we did subconsciously when we were five years old uh, is not so easy when you actually remember um, of how we actually did this. So what they are doing is they are making a guess and sometimes a guess is wrong and that's when you actually have a form that is not correct like goat or gooses. The second evidence um, to the fact that it is not just imitation has to do with um, two concepts that Noam Chomsky talked about. It has to do with competence versus performance. And so competence always precedes performance. And so uh, here's an example from phonology. Um, so kids very often hear the distinctions between speech sounds, even though they actually cannot produce them. So the kid says, give me fish, uh, meaning fish, but the kid has not acquired sure, so the kid uses fist. And so dad says, is this your fist? And so the kid says, no, it's my fist, because the, the child knows that the dad knows how to produce fish. And so the child thinks that the dad is actually imitating the child or mocking the child. So kids can understand and comprehend things way before they can actually express them. So comprehension precedes expressiveness in children. So the conclusion that we can draw from this is that, well, it's not just imitation the way that children actually acquire language. So what happens when you, you are acquiring your first language is you are hypothesizing certain kinds of rules that exist in the language. And then as and when they get input, as and when they hear certain things and patterns and generalize it, they start to learn um, things that they stop making mistakes. And now, if you aren't already fascinated by how children actually do this, you can see that there are many, many factors that actually complicate uh, language acquisition. So we will look at a couple of them. The first one is that, well, we've already seen this uh, throughout the semester, that certain rules are actually really complicated. Linguistics is not e an easy subject, right? I mean, we've noticed that things like phonological rules and things like phonetic transcription, etc., they come with a certain level of complexity. Um, and so we have already seen things like syllabification algorithm, we have seen aspiration, vowel length, etc., that actually really, really complicate um, factors when it comes to language learning. And if these rules are just very basic linguistic rules that we've talked about, but obviously there are many, many more rules that we haven't been able to talk about in um, this introductory class. Uh, and these rules are pretty advanced. And somehow kids below the age of four, uh, actually they figure out these rules pretty easily. The second complicating factor is that we are not actively teaching or correcting the child and correcting the child actually has shown to not do anything. We saw this in the first module. So kids are actually learning the system quite passively. Uh, and the third complicating factor is that even if you correct them, children ignore it right away, right? They, they actually don't care about this. So the problem that this causes is that there is a crucial part of learning, right? Which is feedback and correction, but the kids are not using that to reliably learn a first language. So these are factors that again complicate first language acquisition. The fourth factor is that we all speak language really quickly. So when you speak to a child, you are not breaking the sentence up into different words and different syllables, etc. So, for example, if you want to ask your child, do you want a cookie? You're not saying, do you want a cookie? Breaking it up into the five different words that it's composed of. You are just kind of saying it all in one go and you say, do you want a cookie? Do you want a cookie? Do you want a cookie? Right? It sounds like one word. So, how does the child actually know how to break this up into different words and know where word boundaries are and that kind of thing? So here I have a fun fact. So the parent says, we are going to Miami and the kid says, I don't want to go you, your Amy, right? So the, the, the child is trying to just imitate the child, uh, the, the parent and um, mock the parent because um, he doesn't know, he or she doesn't know where the word boundaries are in the sentence. 
And the fifth complicating factor is that language learning is pretty quick. So by the time you are four and by the time, definitely by the time you are six, you have already mastered your first language. You already know um, all the rules, all the linguistic complexities of your first language and it's done, right? So the real burning question is, how does the child actually do it? And we kind of gave a idea in the first uh, week and this had to do with language instinct. So maybe the idea is that you are geared to picking up a first language. You are, uh, it's hardwired in your DNA, right? Like you have a, a box in your head that actually lets you pick up a language. And we saw that, well, maybe if you look at birdsong, um, then there are some kind of similarities between the way that birds actually learn the song of their species and how children actually acquire language. And since language is a system of rules and representations, this knowledge must concern the rules and representations that language can actually have. So how does a child before four actually figure out all these rules? The answer is that the child already knows what these kind of rules and what these kind of representation looks like. So part of the work already is done for them. They come with what we call a template for the linguistic rules inside their head. And to learn their language, what, what kids do is that they just fill in the parameters, they fill in all these kind of boxes to the language of their choice. If it's English, they tick all the boxes that put into English. If it's Spanish, they tick all the boxes put into Spanish. So again, we're not talking about bilingualism uh, because that requires a totally different skill set and a totally different way of learning things. But we are really talking about acquiring your first language and not a second language. So the conclusion uh, that we can uh, reach is that kids have something innate in them about language learning, right? So learning a language is something which is a very complicated thing, yet children actually do this quite effortlessly because they already have a preconceived template that they are born with uh, that aids them in language learning. One of the key answers to this has to do with universal grammar. This is again a key idea in modern day linguistics uh, and it is given by Noam Chomsky who we talked about earlier in this lecture. And so universal grammar, often called as UG, are facts about grammar and they're universal because it belongs to all human beings irrespective of the language. And there are two pieces of evidence for universal grammar. The first one has to do with the limit to the kind of mistakes that children make. We saw earlier that children make mistakes, but there are limits to the kind of mistakes that they can make. And there are also limits to the kind of rules that languages can have. So these are the two kinds of limits. So let's look at these two limits. The first one are limits to kids' mistake, and I'm going to give you um, an example for this. So we will look at something called the morphy modern constraint when we get into morphology. Um, next week and the week after. But the idea is that in morphology, when you build up words, you actually put together certain kinds of things that have meaning. These are called morphemes. And there are ways in which you can order the morphemes. So if you order morphemes in a particular way versus another way, sometimes you get ungrammaticality. So here's a question that's happened in the lab. So um, very often there are child language acquisition labs. And so children come into these labs with their parents and then they ask all these kinds of questions. So one of the questions that a child language acquisition lab uh, asked a child was, what do you call a monster that eats mice? And so one of the kids' answer was mouse eater, and another kid's answer was mice eater. And as you can see, both answers are correct and they are legitimate. But when the experimenter asked, what do you call a monster that eats cookies? All the kids, no matter who was tested, said cookie eater. Nobody said cookies eater. The idea is that when you look at the morphe modern constraint, which we will come to next week in morphology, once you add a plural marker, like the sir at the end of cookies, 
The plural marker does not allow you to add anything else after it. So, for example, if you have already pluralized something like cookie to cookies, you can't do cookiesing, right? Or cookies man or any other thing that you can add to the end of uh, a particular word. So what happens is that you can say cookie to, because cookie is a singular uh, morpheme, but cookies is already, uh, there's already an extra morpheme in that, so you cannot do cookies either. So the child already knows that, right? Even those below three years old who come to the lab and is asked this question, they actually know how to do this. So there are limits to kids' mistakes and nobody is teaching them morphe modern constraint, right? Nobody is teaching them morphe modern constraint unless you come to college and you take introduction to linguistics, right? Here's a second example. Um, and so um, a lot of what we do in linguistics has to do with corpuses. Um, and thanks to the internet revolution and digital humanities, now we have corpuses for almost anything. And so one of the biggest corpuses that we have is child language data. Um, um, and we have multiple corpuses, multiple databases. And so what people have done is people have taken corpuses, adult corpuses, and compared them with child corpuses. So here's an example of things from the adult corpus. So all the sentences on the left hand side are good sentences if you can think of mistakes that a child can make right and those are the ones on the right hand side now linguists have analyzed corpuses they have analyzed 66,000 sentences of recorded child speech and the cool thing is that none of these mistakes actually happen right so kids actually don't make mistakes that are not part of the regular kind of mistakes that we expect them to make, right? That is, the kind of mistakes that they can make are actually quite limited and they are common across kids, right? And across languages even. So the conclusion that we can draw from this is that there are certain kinds of linguistic errors that kids never make. And why is it that they don't make these kind of linguistic errors? It's because they already have an idea of what the rules are for generalization uh, of things like plural marker and morphe modeling and things like that. And this is in line with the fact that if the child has a universal grammar, then it's easy for the child to not make those mistakes because then the child is actually conforming to that particular grammatical pattern in the child's head. Now, an exciting prediction that UG actually uh, makes with respect to language variation is that we are born with a template for linguistic rules, right? We are born with this kind of limitation and we understand rules and how these rules actually operate across languages, right? Not just for English, but also for Spanish and Italian and all these predictions that we can actually make uh, across these languages. But that's the topic that we will look at um, starting next week.